எனக்கு கொஞ்சம் கொஞ்சம் தமிழ் தெரியும் பேச முடியாது அதுக்கு தான் நான் இங்கிலீஷ்ல பேசுறேன் ஐம் ஷோர் ஆல் ஆஃப் யூ அண்டர்ஸ்டாண்ட் இங்கிலீஷ் வெரி என்லைட்டன் ஆடியன்ஸ் ஸ்ரீ கோபால் கிருஷ்ண காந்தி பீப்புள்ஸ் சாய்ஸ் ஃபார் தி வைஸ் பிரசிடென்ட் ஆஃப் இண்டியா வென் வி ஃபீல் இம் ஆஸ் அ கேண்டிடேட் அபார்ட் ஃப்ரம் தட் ஹீஸ் காட் மெனி அதர் ஆட்டிபியூட்ஸ் ஸ்ரீ பி சிதம்பரம் அ ஃபார்மர் மினிஸ்டர் a very veteran uh, political leader in the country tirichi siva and uh, from the diraja from the chilamba chilamba from tirichi siva and diraja i had the honor of being a colleague of them till recently in the raj sabha they continue to be there in the raj sabha and holding the flag high of indian nation code and and we hope that they continue to hold high the flag of indian nation code in the raj sabha while we will extend all support from the outside which is the cpi intellectual property right that is outside support that that, that support will always be there when we call of you but uh, i hesitate because all three of them erudite speakers make good contributions they have spoken a lot about challenges to indian nation therefore that is in itself a deterrent for me to speak for for a long time and also the fact that today many of us are uh, naturally very very concerned about the health of kalenga from the airport i went directly to the hospital to see him kalenga has always been and he lived his life as a fighter and i went there and i went there to only wish him that even in this fight that he is currently going through even in this fight he will emerge victorious like he always did in the past and with that best wishes we are all here with our concerns so that is another factor that actually will act as a deterrent to speak longer on this you heard many aspects of the challenges facing india but if you sum it all up all that has been said so far and all that many of us intuitively feel the challenge that we are facing today is to the concept of indian nationhood it is the indian nationhood that is being challenged and this challenge comes from a multiple ways you heard the economic aspect from mr chidambaram you heard the uh, social justice aspect from mr raja you heard the federalism aspect from mr uh, shiva the four pillars on which the indian constitution stands defines indian nationhood and that is secular democracy federalism in terms of central state relations social justice in terms of the marginalized and socially oppressed sections of our people being brought to the levels of equality and economic self reliance these four pillars on which this constitution stands all of them are being assaulted today there is not a single aspect of indian nationhood that is not being assaulted now we all know the various aspects and and we are undergoing all those things whether it is the private armies in the name of cow protection moral policing love jihad or now child kidnapping targeting muslims and harijans dalits and murdering them 46 incidents that have happened in the last one year itself of mass of mob lynching all this is happening through state patronage all of us know otherwise they cannot survive but then this assault that is coming is a comprehensive assault that is not emerged overnight it is not as though only this government led by mr narendra modi is mounting this attacks but it has a long history which all of us will have to understand and internalize because this is a very very serious battle about what will be the character of india as we know of it today and this history begins nearly a century ago when the question arose what should be the character of independent india the national movement led by the indian national congress then envisaged the future of india independent india as a secular democratic republic yes the left which was part of the national movement attending the icc sessions for a long long time during the freedom movement had said 
But we cannot stop there, being only a secular democratic India. Unless we proceed to convert the political independence that we will achieve from overthrowing the British into the economic independence of every individual living in our country, this character of secular democracy itself will come under threat. And that is why the economic equality must be assured and that economic independence and equality can only come when we move towards socialism and that was the left's objective, not only extending the Congress, of, Congress vision, but also offering a, a potential critique in the sense that if this economic independence is not achieved, that in itself will lead to the undermining of the secular democratic foundations because people's discontent will be utilized by the reactionary forces to destroy the very constitution and its values. The third vision that emerged during this time had a, <coughs> the, it was a twin vision. That was a vision based that the character of India will be defined by the religious affiliation of its people. The twin brothers that emerged from this vision was that of the Muslim League which demanded an Islamic India and the RSS that demanded a Hindu rush. So the battle between these three visions, what will be the character of India, a secular democratic republic? To sustain the republic, we have to move towards socialism or whether we go back to defining the character of India in terms of the religiosity of its people. Like you had an Islamic Pakistan, would you want a Hindu rush in India? And that battle was a battle that took place during the course of our freedom struggle and it continues to take place even today. What we are finding is challenges today, or threats today to the Indian nationhood, are threats that emanate from this vision that this secular democratic republic of India as envisaged in our constitution that must be transformed into a rapidly intolerant, theocratic, a fascistic Hindu Rashtra of the vision of the RSS and that battle which the people of India rejected at the time of our independence. We rejected that vision. We adopted a secular democratic republic. Our forefathers wrote this constitution and we are proud that in 1950, we were able to give a constitution that was a visionary document in the whole world at that point of time. Why do I say that? Very few countries in the world gave universal suffrage. That is, every man has, every adult in India has a vote irrespective of his caste, creed or religion. Or sex, man or woman. Remember when uh, President Obama of the USA came to India as a state guest in the parliament those days I was a member of parliament, even now you are in the parliament we have what is called a golden book. There is nothing golden in that book. So don't worry, there is no, not even a thola of gold in that book. But it's called the golden book and in that golden book visiting dignitaries come and leave a comment. So Obama wrote there, greetings from the world's oldest democracy to the world's largest democracy. That evening at the banquet in the, the Rashtrapati Bhavan, at the occasion to each one of us was introduced and so we had the occasion to talk to the President of the USA. And I told him, sir, I think you have to correct your history because you said the oldest democracy in the true sense, democracy in the United States of America, where all colored Americans, particularly black Americans, who are now called the uh, Afro, I mean, American Africans, I think, uh, or, the, or Africa, uh, African Americans, they received the universal right to vote only in 1962. President Obama was born in 1961. So he said, one year after you were born, you got the right to vote in your country. The day we were born, we gave the right to vote to every Indian irrespective of caste. That was our 
forward looking progressive uh, constitution which we gave ourselves that is why we say we the people have given ourselves this constitution now every single tenet of that constitution is under attack because the vision that this constitution speaks of is not the vision that the rss and the bjp is only the political arm of the rss and it only implements the or carries forward the vision of the rss so that really is the danger or the threat or the challenge so you cannot talk in terms of peace meal it is not as though you make this reform it will be okay you have a new law against mob lynching problem will be solved no the problem will reemerge in a different way what has to be removed is the concept of that vision which wants to convert a secular demo the secular democratic republic into their version of a hindu rashtra that has to be removed from authority and power that is why today to meet the challenges that india faces if you want to save india today so that we can change it for the better tomorrow then this government has to be removed from office at delhi and that has to be the priority of all patriots and that is the, that is the need of the hour today and that is why this battle be continue because the indian people rejected because mahatma gandhi was the tallest leader when we rejected the version of a theocratic hindu state like the theocratic islamic state in pakistan when we rejected that the tallest leader of the freedom movement mahatma gandhi was assassinated why did he fall to the bullets of a hindu fanatic he fell because that vision was not accepted and he being the leader did not allow that vision to be accepted so now today we are facing that threat in this new form and that is why it is again i repeat it's not a question of one reform or the other new law law for mob lynching or a new economic uh, what it called prescription it is actually this whole wholesale package that we have today that has to be removed so that india can be saved in order to be changed for the better and that involves all these four aspects that i was talking about and in order to four aspects of secular democracy social justice federalism and your economic self reliance if that has to be done then we will have to fine tune the system of our constitutional framework in a much better way after 70 years of its existence what are the threats to democracy today? but before we, we we can do all this fine tuning but before that this danger has to be removed and to contend with this danger we have to meet another reality and what is that reality that is called the post truth it's a new term that has been coined called post truth oxford dictionary defines post truth as the word of the year in 2017 they declared it word of the year of 2016 and how do they define post truth they define post truth as a propaganda vehicle that has nothing to do with the existing reality but it just propagates the leader's views or or works on the emotions of the people and not on the ground reality and that is exactly what is happening in india today with mr narendra modi the reality of our dalits and muslims being murdered that is totally ignored not one the prime minister is a big tweeter he's got a lot of following on the honest tweeter twitter account no one one message of either remorse concern or condolence to the people who died out of these mob lynchings not one is a different world that 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 they are projecting and that is what is the world of post truth tamil nadu is also uh, i mean tamilians also i mean i was born in the city of madras so i am also a, a part of that culture those days it was called the madras central general hospital so that's where i was born before the bifurcation of the states happened and we moved to andhra but we are there's a lot of influence of cinema and uh, we all have uh, our emotionally our bond to cinema in uh, in the since i was born here but i grew up uh, outside here and mostly in north india
So in the Hindi film tradition, there is one film uh, producer and a director who was <coughs> all his films were great success stories, silver jubilees, golden jubilees. Those days, he was, his name was Manmohan Desai. I don't know many of you who know Amar Akbar and three, you know, films like that he made. So he was a great big film figure. So one day he was asked before he died, "What is the success of your?" Films. How can each film of yours become a uh, a jubilee, a jubilee hit? His answer was that you see, now that I won't make any more films, I can tell you my formula. My formula is that as soon as the picture begins, till the picture ends, the audience should not be allowed to think. <laughs> If the audience thinks the picture is a failure, so if you want the picture to be a success, don't let the audience think. That is Mr. Modi's formula. Don't let the people think. <laughs> don't let the people think. Every day, a new slogan: Digital India, Stand Up India, Start Up India, you know, Clean India, Unclean India, whatever it is. Every day, he'll give a new slogan. That is the post-truth reality. It's got, got nothing to do with your existing, your living conditions. Now this has to be met and defeated. If this has to be met, our system of democracy has to be fine-tuned. What is it done today with the system of elections? No, democracy in itself in our country was actually, I mean, we are suffering from a very big anomaly. I think Mr. Chidambaram can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we had a single government in the centre which commanded more than 50% of the people who voted. Once, maybe. Then Tagore. Huh? Huh? Rajiv Gandhi. No, Rajiv Gandhi also got 404 seats, but... Oh, yes. But, very, but more than 50% of the people who have cast vote, no government except for once, what Mr. Chairman does me, no government in the centre ever commanded. Forget 50% of the people. I'm talking of 50% of people who voted. No, democracy is what? The rule of the majority. Today you have a government which is 31% of the uh, people who voted. That is 69% of the people voted against the BJP today. But they are in the government. Two thirds of India votes against them. At least 25%, one fourth of India does not participate in the voting. So if you take from the total electorate of India, this is a government that enjoys the support of one-fifth of the Indian people. But they are in government. We must ask ourselves the question, is this democracy? We have to change this anomaly and therefore we should move towards a partial rep proportional representative system. Whereby the parties will get the number of seats in accordance, like it happens in many Western democracies in accordance with the percentage of popular support they receive in an election. And in that sense, every government that will be formed, because the majority has to be formed, will necessarily have to enjoy the support of majority of the people who voted for that coalition, that will form that government. Unless we do that, a proportional representative system in partial sense, this democracy doesn't, we cannot improve it further. And if we don't improve it, such forces, such communal forces take advantage and they come to power and then they will go about destroying the very foundations on which our republic today stands. Secondly, what did Mr. Modi's government do? It changed your political funding laws. All other issues since others have spoken, I'm not repeating them. But what is the change that they brought about? Earlier, my party for instance, and I've been arguing, that you ban the corporate funding of political parties because corporate funding is the fountainhead of political corruption. Corporates don't give money out of generosity. Corporates give money because they think this party may come into government. For them it's an investment. That is why very few corporates give us money because they don't have that confidence that we'll, we'll join the government even if we support a government. But they know we will not join the government, we will be outside support, so therefore they won't give us. But they, suppose they, they give the other ruling class parties.
From there begins the fountain head of political corruption. Let the corporates donate. You, will, I mean, you have like the corporate social uh, responsibility fund. You have a corporate democratic democracy fund. Let them donate to the government or an agency like the election commission, etc. Let that be used for a system of state funding, like it happens in many Western democracies. And that will also help and eliminate all this control of money power over elections. It's like casting a stone on a mountain for me to speak on control of money power over elections in Tamil Nadu. Because, 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 because you are experts at it, but you reach much higher levels than the rest of the country. Every country knows about it. But this is destroying, I mean, people are not voting on the basis of political choices. People are not voting on the basis of which party is good, which party is bad. People vote on the basis of which party gives you more money, which doesn't. And the situation has come to such a pass, a sorry state for our democracy. In many parts of the country where I go, a common question, common people ask me, yes, comrade, why do we have elections only once in five years? I said, what do you mean? He said, why don't we have them every year? So that every year we'll get all this money and every year people will come and give us something or the other. So it's, this is making a mockery of it. Now what has Mr. Modi done? You what we call electoral bonds. Earlier, any corporate has to go, could give only 7%, not more than 7% of his average profits for the last three years. That limit is now removed. Once you remove that limit, and you introduce electoral bonds, even a company existing for three years is not necessary. So anybody can go buy these corporate bonds, give those I mean, electoral bonds, give those bonds to any political party. That party can go and, and cash them in the bank. Who gave it? Who was given that? Which party? Instead of transparency, you have complete opaqueness of political funding. And this is actually legalizing political corruption. All the money, money laundering, all the black money can be open. You can open a shell, shell company. Through that company, root all your bank money, buy electoral, I mean, your electoral bonds, and give it to your own party. And then that becomes converted into white. This is the perfection of the system of money laundering and legitimizing political corruption. Instead of transparency, you have this sort of opaqueness that has come. And no wonder that everybody today, every one of us today faces, we anyway are in the other end of the spectrum, but in most of the other parties also are unable to compete with the sort of money power that is there in our Electra, in our elections, that is exercised by the ruling party in the BJP today. That is why, my dear brother, what is the challenge before us today is not only, I have spoken on democracy and electoral reform, some aspects. You heard on social justice, you heard on center state relations, you heard on the economic self reliance aspects. Now, all this put together comprehensively, we have to restore India back on its rails in order to fine-tune and further consolidate the secular democratic republic of India. And that secular democratic republic of India, remember your constitution, Article 1, defines India, India that is Bharat, is a union of states. There is no India without the states. And if the states are attacked and you have an autocratic, instead of a federal, you have a unitary system, then the concept of the Indian Republic is also destroyed. So that is why today, social inclusion, economic inclusion, centrist uh, federalism, and economic uh, self-reliance, if all this has to be saved, then the singular threat to this Indian nationhood and this post-truth government that we have today, that has to be removed from office Without that, we cannot, we cannot start our movement forward. That is why I appeal to all of you that this uh, 
sort of a coming together of all like-minded parties. Yes, we'll have differences, we'll fight that out, but the basic denominator is that this republic will remain. If this republic doesn't remain, our differences are meaningless. If India doesn't remain, all other political parties' existence is absolutely meaningless. So therefore, this, saving this in order to, we'll have to move forward. We'll have to move forward to the future. Yes, the past has a lot of glories. We enjoy a lot of our uh, uh, now, Puranas and the Puranic uh, novels and, and the stories of Ramayana, Mahabharata, etc., etc. We regularly take part in them, take so many take pride in them. But the point is, that past must help us build towards a better future. We have to move towards the light of the future and no go back into the darkness of the past. And that is what this BJP and RSS are trying to take us. That is why this assault on education. Indian history study has to, is being replaced by the study of Indian mythological stories. Indian history is Hindu mythology. Indian philosophy, the rich traditions that we have of our philosophical schools, all that is being reduced into Hindu theology. The, di the diversity that we have not only between religions, the diversity that we have within religions, Ramayana, then you have Ramayana, you have Vamana's Onam, then you have Mahabali's Onam. No, this diversity, but we were all united because of one commonality, that is Indian nationhood. That is being destroyed today. And that is why I think my appeal to all of you and I join all my colleagues here and I join all my people here that we first have to save India today in order to change it for the better. And for changing it for the better, we'll all have to move towards to ensure this government, first of all, is removed from office. And once you remove this government from office, then we can, we can fight, we can discuss, we can debate, we can do everything else. But the minimum foundation is this secular democratic republic will remain. And on that basis, we can move forward and let us go into the future. And at this critical moment, we only, once again, I'd like to wish, before I end, wish uh, Kalingal Karunanidhi all the very best, so that he'll, he'll come back into full vigor in life and face and help all of us face this battle, the current battle today, which I think is one of the most critical battles that modern independent India is facing, that we are facing in 2018-19. And this is the battle that we have to win. And there's no question of any other choice. If India has to survive as we know of it, all of us have to win this battle. We have to win this battle. We have to defeat. We have to defeat these forces. Otherwise, the future of India, as we would like to build it, cannot happen. So, with that, I appeal to all of you. And uh, to my friend, teacher, and intellectual of the high order, Gopal Gandhi, who will be presiding over here. I'd say such people will also have to be drawn in not only political parties, but all well-meaning people, intellectuals, leaders, and every Indian patriot must be drawn together in this battle so that we can win. The victory will be ours if we are united, and that is my appeal to you. Thank you. Thank you very much.